welcome to Engineered for Impact, a podcast helping engineers learn and think more about how they can have a positive social impact with their careers. In this episode, I talk to Cameron Tracy, a research scholar at the Stanford Center for International Security and Cooperation, or CSAC. We discuss how Cameron uses his engineering background to do research on topics related to nuclear security and nuclear arms control. We cover how Cameron went from a PhD in materials engineering to researching global security issues, a brief history of the role of academia in international and nuclear security, some of Cameron's research on nuclear arms reduction, nuclear waste management, and hypersonic missiles, how social dynamics shape discourse on existing and emerging technologies, particularly when different nations are involved, the ethical considerations and obligations of engineers, particularly in the weapons and defense space, and finally, how engineers from all disciplines can contribute to improving international security and cooperation. You'll find show notes with valuable resources related to this episode at engineeredforimpact.show forward slash Cameron. That's C-A-M-E-R-O-N. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend or colleague. And without further ado, here's Cameron. My name is Cameron Tracy. I'm a research scholar at Stanford's Center for International Security and Cooperation. This is a center that combines social science and the physical or natural sciences to focus on pressing issues uh, related to global security, especially nuclear security or security uh, regarding the nuclear space and challenges therein. So here I do research and teaching on the intersection between science, technology, and global security, drawing from my background in physics and material science and engineering to try to address problems related to new or emerging weapons technologies. Yeah, fascinating. Well, thanks for joining me today, Cameron. I'm uh, very excited to discuss a couple of your recent publications and and some of the uh, topics around ethics and where engineers sort of fit in um, in that space. But I'm curious, to begin with, having having gained your PhD in material science and engineering, you seem to have jumped straight into doing nuclear security related research uh, as a postdoc. And I'm curious how, like, where that interest in nuclear se- security developed. Yeah, it's often surprising to people working in a variety of fields to find later on in their careers that the work they're doing somehow does relate to military technology development. And so this is what happened to me. So throughout my PhD, I was at the University of Michigan working mainly on nuclear materials. So specifically materials for the management, immobilization, or in some cases, destruction of uh, nuclear waste materials. So the civilian uh, nuclear energy infrastructure, the generation of nuclear energy, results in pretty substantial amounts of waste material, radioactive materials that can be difficult or expensive to manage, to maintain, to store for the long periods of time, tens of thousands or millions of years over which they remain radioactive and therefore a threat to human health and to the environment. So as I was doing this sort of work, uh, I was closely involved with work at the U.S. National Laboratory Complexes, which are essentially the U.S. uh, nuclear laboratories for for the government. And I found that a lot of the work I was doing did, of course, contribute to nuclear energy, to uh, civilian technologies, but also could double as something that is security relevant. So for example, there's been a lot of effort lately to uh, reduce stockpiles of United States weapons plutonium because such a great amount of that was produced during the Cold War. And so the same materials and waste forms I was developing for managing civilian wastes also had those not necessarily military applications, but security relevant applications, uh, relevance to, to nuclear weapons issues. And so this was always something that was uh, at the back of my mind, just an interesting thing that I would write in the introductions to papers, essentially, as you know, this is another potential application of this work that I'm doing. Uh, It wasn't until after I finished my PhD, though, that I really leaned into that area of the work or that facet of it. So I came to Stanford University, where I am currently uh, in 2015 as a postdoctoral researcher. And I was mainly in the geological sciences department, now called earth and planetary sciences. 
because, you know, it wouldn't surprise most people to learn that the earth is made of materials, right? So material sciences is quite relevant in that field. So there I was really studying uh, extremely high pressures and its effect on materials. So we were putting materials in these little cells called diamond anvil cells, exposing them to pressures that you would find at the center of the earth and just seeing what happened. That surprisingly also is, is nuclear weapons relevant work because one of the other places where you encounter those extremely high pressures is during the detonation of a, a nuclear bomb. But that's beside the point. Uh, I was doing this kind of pure science work but also just through some connections I had with colleagues, I learned about this organization that existed here on campus called the Center for International Security and Cooperation, CISAC, we call it CSAC. So when I was here as a postdoc, they had a unique fellowship program and still have to this day that brings political scientists, international relations scholars, but also physical scientists, engineers, life scientists, to come and spend a year as a postdoc or a predoctoral fellow working on issues related to global security, oftentimes nuclear security, which is, of course, where my kind of budding interests lay. So I was lucky enough to, to be accepted to that program, and I spent a couple of years working essentially half time on the fundamental science stuff in the geology department, and then half time here at CSAC, just kind of exploring knowing that uh, there is this overlap between the work I was doing and these really timely, relevant global security issues, what space there was for more technical work to, to help with those issues, to enlighten policymakers as to some of the complex technical matters involved. And from there, being in that sort of interdisciplinary boundary space between global security and basic physics. I came to see a real need for people standing at that boundary to do the translation of complex technical topics to the uh, policy practitioners and uh, related work like that. And I've really leaned into it since then and, and just pursued work at that boundary ever since. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think um, engineers seem to be really well placed to be at that boundary. And I think, uh, We'll discuss that a little bit more when we talk about some of your papers as well, because I think that they provide really excellent examples of just the the need for engineers to be there or for at least people to be playing that translationary role, um, translating sort of technical facts to uh, the general public and sort of bringing them into the social con conscience and the the political sort of discussion. Yeah, the whole point of engineering is really to interact more directly than pure scientists often would with the society in which those engineers operate. So that's, I think, really uh, central to to the the field as a whole of engineering writ large. Yeah, definitely. I guess before we get into that discussion, are you able to give a bit of a brief overview of the academic landscape of nuclear and international security and uh, sort of what function academia currently plays in the field? Yeah, it's a great question because I think to a, a lay observer, it would often seem like nuclear weapons, this is something that world powers deal with. And what's a university got to say about that kind of issue? But actually, the two have been quite closely intermingled since the start of the whole nuclear weapons story. So I'm sure a lot of listeners, uh, a lot of people across the globe have seen Oppenheimer by, by now. Uh, so they'll be familiar with the fact that nuclear weapons were created uh, in the, I mean, depending on when you define it, it can stretch over quite a long period, but really kind of 1930s, 1940s. Uh, by a group of scientists and engineers working at places like Los Alamos National Laboratory in the United States. And a lot of them came straight from academia. Uh, the University of California system and the University of California, Berkeley played a key role in that story because these were and continue to be uh, weapons that kind of exist at the forefront of our scientific and our technical capabilities. So the places where Scientists and engineers work at that forefront is, of course, going to feed into their development, their maintenance, uh, as well as, in some cases, their, their elimination or their uh, reduction for arms control purposes. These sorts of weapons also drew social scientists into the mix because they created capabilities for states and also problems for states that really transcended the uh, 
arena that was seen as the typical domain of the state. You know, it's no longer about managing armies on the battlefield to to fight neighbors and land wars. All of a sudden, there exists a weapon that coupled with delivery systems like intercontinental ballistic missiles that can deliver them to the opposite side of the globe in a matter of tens of minutes, uh, creates a new risk for untold amounts of destruction uh, that creates vast challenges that states at the time were really unequipped to deal with and continue to be poorly equipped to deal with. So you have social scientists figuring out things like how nuclear deterrence relationships work or how cooperative arms control, that is the reduction of the number of nuclear weapons that states bring to bear against their adversaries, can actually increase the safety of both adversaries uh, engaged in a nuclear deterrence relationship. So things that would seem kind of counterintuitive, you often need people at the forefront of, of their fields, even on the social side of things, to really figure out how, how to manage. And so then you fast forward today and, you know, roughly 80 years since uh, the, the detonation of the first nuclear weapon. And universities still play a key role because you have these technologies that to this day are, are at the forefront of our science and engineering capabilities. But you couple that with about 80 years of entrenched thinking where you have a variety of interests, military, humanitarian, scientific, technical, all kind of crossing with one another at this exact site of the nuclear weapon. Some will say we need fewer of them. Some say we need more. Some say we should use them in one way. Some say we should use them in a, uh, another. So all of these challenging issues are as pressing today as they were at many times throughout history, perhaps any time throughout history, given the current geopolitical situation, but they're unsolved problems. And as we deal with this cross-cutting nature of these issues, then you run into problems where if you take 80 years of entrenched thinking and siloing of the different disciplines that are meant to cooperatively solve this problem, then you run into issues that fortunately universities can be uniquely situated to solve because essentially every university has an economics department, has a political science department, has an international relations department. Many don't have nuclear engineering departments, but they have a vast number of engineering departments nonetheless that have key contributions to make, physics. It's one place where you can often, not easily, but with quite a bit of effort, hopefully convene people from these different spheres to come to new solutions and new thinking about some of these issues. So there are still only a handful of places uh, that really practice this. So in the United States, two uh, key actors in the university and the academic space that deal with nuclear security would be one, my institution, uh, CSAC at Stanford University. There's another, uh, the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard University. Both of these have large research wings as well as fellowship and training programs to try to get social scientists, scientists, engineers involved in solving those issues and bring them into this kind of unfamiliar esoteric world of nuclear security that few train in at their undergraduate or grad school level, but really needs contributions across the board. It being such a interdisciplinary and cross-cutting topic, it seems like it would just be hard to train people from an undergraduate level or even a I guess, postgraduate level to be directly contributing at the highest level. Uh, and perhaps you really do need those experts who, who come with uh, more years of focus training in a more uh, constrained area, such as yourself looking at like explicitly materials, engineering and science, disposal of, of nuclear waste, uh, to be able to bring that level of understanding and knowledge to, to the field. Um, do you have an impression of how most people get into it, uh, who sort of get an introduction to it? Are, are most people seeking to sort of use the skill set and the, the the knowledge that they've developed over you know years of uh, of research and of of academic training to then apply it in the space, or is it really a or kind of more of a recruitment effort of, of getting people who have those requisite skills into the space? It ends up a lot of the time being a recruitment effort. Uh, despite the, the clear importance of these issues, uh, it's a small field of people that really focus in their day-to-day -day life on them. 
What that means is that you often lack just the visibility. We don't have, of course, nuclear security majors uh, at any university I'm aware of. Uh, but in a way, that's a good thing because it's it's so necessary to avoid that kind avoid that kind of siloing and that entrenched thinking I was talking about earlier. That I think there's a real benefit to having people who didn't train to solve this particular problem look at this problem. Uh, we have such a diversity of views on not just what the solutions are, but even how to define what the problems are when it comes to nuclear security, whether you're concerned about your nation having a more powerful nuclear arsenal or whether, for example, on the opposite end of one particular spectrum, you want nuclear weapons eliminated from the globe, thinking that they are a major threat to the continued existence to, uh, of humanity. That coming to the table, you know, to try to uh, find a middle ground between those two views is, is maybe not the most fruitful path forward. So oftentimes it can be more useful to have people from a diversity of backgrounds, a diversity of views being brought to at least awareness of this issue so that they can attack what they perceive to be a problem from different angles. Uh, so that means recruitment is is key, and that's why I think it's so important for academic institutions like Stanford CSAC to have these fellowship programs where they bring people in, sometimes for only a single year, from a different field, from a different institution, to come here and just spend a year thinking hard about these issues and coming with whatever background, whatever disciplinary uh, repertoire they have and saying, how can I apply that here? And sometimes, as in my case, people will say, wow, I think uh, I need to spend the rest of my life addressing these issues. And, and oftentimes that's quite a fruitful activity, but it can be just as useful, I think, to, to really think hard about these and try and make a contribution in a brief amount of time and then go back to whatever your main area of focus is. Ultimately, what we need is just people willing to and able to put in that brief amount of expertise, uh, at least. To, to contribute to the, the diversity of thinking and the knowledge base that we have here. Yeah, it seems like a great way to cross-pollinate ideas from different fields and, and even, as you said, just different ways of thinking, different ways of problem solving and, and different perspectives um, that people gain throughout yeah, educating in, in different realms. It's strange, though, to think of it as a, a field. I, I actually struggle to think of any other single technological artifact, maybe the automobile, uh, the internal combustion engine, something along these lines, but one single technological artifact that so much work in the, the physical, the social sciences, the natural sciences, engineering has, has been uh, shaped by and has sort of coalesced around. Yeah, I guess when you think about the, the technical complexity and how close to the frontier it is, I guess it kind of makes sense that there is such a big field around it just to match the the level of, of technical complexity, maybe. Um, there's, I guess there's a few other other technologies that are right at the forefront there. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Uh, and often this this kind of big science sort of endeavor uh, necessarily is, is so cross-cutting because you need massive funding for that sort of thing and you need uh, the organization of... of large numbers of people to produce these kinds of technologies that necessarily are going to end up in that kind of situation where just the coordination of, of that many people, of that much capital and so on is going to grow to, to self-perpetuate itself. Yeah, yeah. All right, I'd like to discuss uh, a couple of your recent papers. Um, and I think we'll start with uh, looking at the disposal of nuclear waste. So are you able to give me an overview of the work that you are doing in your disposal, destruction and disarmament paper? Uh, and also we can talk about the mining for the bomb paper as well, because I think that uh, they're both quite interesting examples of applying what is pretty like core engineering type work that, you know, if you were to do it out of the context of nuclear waste, it would just be interesting engineering work, I think, um, but it's being applied in, in, in this interesting context. Um, yeah, and, and we'll obviously have links to these papers available in the show notes as well for people to, to dig into a bit deeper. Yeah, so this, of course, has applications to the civilian sphere, as I was talking about earlier. A lot of the nuclear waste that exists across the globe comes from civilian nuclear energy generation. 
Uh, what I think is a little more interesting and a little more surprising often is the military dimensions of this thing. So I'll talk first a little bit about the background of that, about why we need to get rid of nuclear materials to enhance global security, hopefully. Uh, so this gets into arms reductions as a key component of arms control in the nuclear space. Now, arms control, its, it's kind of basic definition is cooperative action, that is action between states, to do three things. One, to hopefully reduce the likelihood of the outbreak of war, but also to reduce the costs of preparing for war that nations have to, to put in, you know, to invest in the development of weapons and the production. And three, to reduce the scale of destruction that would result should war occur. So arms control has proven quite popular, uh, fortunately, not just in recent decades, but actually going back uh, hundreds and in some cases uh, more than a thousand years. Because this is, in many cases, beneficial to both states, even engaged in an adversarial relationship, if they can, for example, knowing that they're going to prepare for war with one another, reduce the costs that that imposes on each state, or knowing that war might occur between them, reduce the destruction that would occur. Uh, particularly important with nuclear weapons, where you get into this uh, quite reasonable question about whether it even is possible to win a nuclear war, because the destruction that would occur uh, would be so unimaginable uh, in an all-out nuclear war that you know defining a winner in that sort of situation might become a bit of a, a moot point. So from the roughly uh, late 1960s to somewhere in the 2010s, uh, the U.S. and the Soviet Union, then Russia uh, after 91, made a great deal of progress on nuclear arms control. There were a series of agreements, uh, the Strategic Offensive Reductions Treaty, the um, START treaties, uh, most recently New START, which... Uh, is kind of in troubled waters right now, but in, in the last uh, 10 years or so, set strict limits on the number of nuclear warhead delivery systems that each nation could deploy. Uh, together, that series of agreements removed from deployment thousands of those delivery systems, things like the intercontinental ballistic missiles that the US and Russia point at one another daily. Uh, under those agreements, some nuclear weapons were even dismantled, so they were not just removed from deployment, but they were really taken apart, which the argument is makes the world a safer place because, say, total nuclear war were to occur. Of course, avoiding nuclear war is of paramount importance, but it's probably better if 999 warheads are detonated compared to 1,000, right? So each one you remove is, is somewhat of an improvement, even if, if just at the margins. But it turns out that the limiting factor in making a nuclear weapon is not assembling the uh, mechanical electrical components and so on. It's not putting it onto a missile. It's actually making the what's called fissile material that is the central ingredient of these weapons, making that in the first place. So these fissile materials are typically uh, plutonium, weapons-grade plutonium, or highly enriched uranium. So uranium being a natural material that you can mine from the earth, you uh, process it in a certain way to enrich it in certain isotopes, uh, that is, atoms of uranium with more or fewer neutrons, to make it good for use in a nuclear weapon. You can irradiate that uranium in a nuclear reactor and through certain uh, neutronics reactions, uh, convert it to plutonium, but also is good for making a nuclear weapon. So that process is, that's where a lot of the complexity, that's where a lot of the time, and that's where a lot of the expense of making a nuclear warhead come into play. Meaning that if you dismantle a warhead, okay, great, you made some progress. But as long as the plutonium still sits there, as long as the high enriched uranium still sits there, a large fraction of the effort that would go into making that back into a nuclear weapon has already been completed, right? So if you really want those kinds of arms reductions to be permanent, to be more or less irreversible, you need to do something about that fissile material, about that little chunk of metal sitting there on a shelf somewhere. This is really hard. You know, it is just a chunk of metal, but uh, it's, it's a single element in the case of plutonium, right? Uh, uranium as well. So making an element into something else is, is really hard. You know, there's a reason the alchemists spent so much time on this issue. Despite that, uh, in the early 1990s, after the end of the Cold War, the fall of the Soviet Union, there was quite a bit of optimism uh, in the U.S. and Russia, especially in scientific and technical communities, about starting to solve some of these longstanding issues. 
one of those issues being the stockpiles of fissile material that existed in both nations. Stockpiles that are agreed by the governments uh, of, of both nations to be far in excess of what they need for military purposes. So it's not like, you know, these were uh, peacenik scientists who are totally opposed to the existence of nuclear weapons. No, this was the military itself in, in the U.S., for example, saying we made way too much of this stuff during the Cold War. This makes us less safe just at existing. I mean, even beyond the uh, uh, the possibility of us using it or of them using it, if it were stolen, if it were diverted, if a non-state actor got their hands on it, that's a huge danger uh, to, to the global populace. So there's interest in doing something about this. In uh, 2001, a bilateral agreement was signed, the PMDA, Plutonium Management and Disposition Agreement, under which each nation, the United States and Russia, would permanently dispose of a portion of their excess weapons plutonium stockpile. The plan at the time was to convert a portion of this plutonium stockpile to nuclear fuel that you could then use in a nuclear reactor as you would any other commercial fuel. So you generate some energy from it. Also, once it comes out, it's now something else. It's now spent nuclear fuel which is fundamentally different in its composition, its isotopic composition, its uh, atomic composition from the material that went in. Now, this was somewhat a controversial uh, decision to pursue this mode of disposal because spent fuel does still contain plutonium that is not necessarily weapons grade, but could be used in a nuclear weapon. The argument, though, among proponents of this idea was that, well, yeah, you could use it in a nuclear weapon just as you could civilian spent fuel, but it's not nearly as good, right? It's no longer weapons grade. It's also extremely radioactive when it comes out of the reactor, so it would just be very difficult to process in the first place. So it's, you know, it's not a perfect solution, but the argument was that it gets us a lot of the way there. It makes it less usable in a weapon. So this is what the nations agreed on. Uh, there was a lot of effort throughout the 2000s, 2010s on this problem. It ultimately fell apart due to cost issues though. So in the United States, uh, there's never been a commercial program for what's called reprocessing, which is using plutonium as a nuclear fuel in civilian reactors. So other nations, France, for example, has a huge reprocessing program where they burn uh, commercial nuclear fuel. Some plutonium is produced. They use that to make new fuel, use that in a reactor. In the U.S., we've never really used plutonium as a fuel. So that didn't make this impossible, but it meant that the U.S. wasn't really prepared for this kind of challenge. So they would need to uh, invest a large amount of money into this, build some new infrastructure for making that plutonium-based fuel in the first place. Initial estimates for this were a few billion dollars. So expensive, but when it comes to nuclear arms control, maybe worth it. That quickly and regularly, every few years, uh, ballooned and ballooned and ballooned. Until recently, I think the most recent projections, depending on the time scale over which you would construct this facility, were somewhere in the ballpark of like 20 to uh, $100 billion. And this was for opening it somewhere around 2050, something like that. So it was more or less off the table. This wasn't going to happen. Uh, the U.S. has always had pretty, pretty substantial nuclear workforce issues, challenges, just in general with any kind of uh, large capital intensive uh, infrastructure project like this. And this PMDA program, this Plutonium Management and Disposition Agreement uh, mandated program, fell into that same sort of trap. So ultimately, the U.S. unilaterally declared, hey, we're no longer going to convert this to nuclear fuel like we originally agreed upon. Instead, we're gonna bury it out in New Mexico. Russia wasn't very happy about that. They essentially said, well, you know, we're going to all this work to do what we originally agreed upon. You're now telling us you're just gonna bury it. We think you're just gonna dig it up again and use it later, right? Like this is not the permanent disposal that we were interested in. Already relationship, the relationship between the US and Russia was pretty strained. So this kind of cooperation was becoming difficult with this new uh, strain on the whole issue, essentially the agreement fell apart. Uh, both nations have now backed out of that deal. So finally, that comes to the technical stuff. There's a lot of work that can be done just to figure out what went wrong and what uh, prospects there might be down the line for, for reinvigorating this kind of effort, because it remains key to the permanence and the irreversibility 
of nuclear arms control writ large. So as an example, some of the work I did was when the U.S. moved unilaterally to this uh, burial strategy to bury uh, excess weapons plutonium in a facility called the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIPP, W-I-P-P, in southeastern New Mexico, uh, the claim was that actually it would be more or less impossible to recover this material, or at least that that process would be slower and more expensive and more difficult than just making new plutonium in the first place. So the argument there is that actually it's a pretty good solution, right? It, it does reduce the uh, likelihood of a nuclear weapon being built and then launched and used. The Russians disagreed, uh, but all of this was kind of happening at the high political level, right? So what we were interested in, um, a colleague of mine and I, was just who's right here? You know, How difficult would it be to mine for plutonium that you had buried in this waste isolation pilot plant? And that's a pretty interesting engineering challenge. And of course, fields like mining engineering and geochemistry and so on would have a lot to say about this. So that seemed like a good place for us to use some of our technical expertise to look into the issue. Uh, we did that study. We looked at everything from uh, the kind of borehole you would dig to access this buried material to the geochemistry that would go on under the surface when you're trying to leach it out of the uh, material that it would be diluted in before burial all of these technical aspects. And what we ultimately found was that actually it would be much easier, uh, much quicker, and much cheaper to recover this material than was commonly claimed on the US side. So this was uh, not the best timing for us to come to this conclusion because uh, it, it, we published the paper uh, a year or two ago. So, you know, the Russo-Ukrainian war is going on right now. Not the best time to say, hey, actually uh, the Russian scientific community was right on this issue. But when we think about nuclear weapons and nuclear security being a problem that is going to stick with us for, I mean, not just our lifetimes, but the tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands or millions of years that this fissile material remains with us and remains fissile before it decays. This is, again, a problem that really transcends those kind of short time scale issues. So even if there is really no prospect for cooperative uh, plutonium stockpile management or cooperative plutonium destruction right now, that is a problem that humankind is going to have to, uh, to contend with someday. So that's why I feel like this, uh, this, this technical work is so important because if political conditions do change such that all of a sudden it becomes practical again to pursue those kinds of goals, we need to have the technical know-how to, to hit the ground running, to immediately start working on it. And so that's why I think it's so important for scientists, for engineers to be involved in this space, even if it seems, you know, like we should be pessimistic about the prospects of progress. Everything is impossible until it happens, right? So if we at least, to the extent possible, solve the technical problems now, then you're setting up a, a good environment, a conducive environment to ultimately solve some of these larger challenges down the line. It's a really interesting topic for me because I think for engineers, uh, the facts are kind of like the key thing that we're that we're sort of taught to care about. Like we, you know, start with the fundamental equation, apply it to a scenario, and find out what the true answer is. Like find out what the actual fact of the matter is. Uh, and when it comes to then applying an engineering mindset and doing engineering work in a social or public policy context, there's another factor that needs to be accounted for, and it's that that translation. So the, there was a quote from your uh, paper, Mining for the Bomb, the Vulnerability of Buried Plutonium to Clandestine Recovery, uh, that I really liked uh, around this. So the quote was, a great deal of work in the security studies literature has focused on the effects of technological change on global security. Yet this literature typically treats technology as a black box, neglecting the social roles of technologists in interpreting, shaping, and reacting to it. Uh, I think this is like a, a mental model that engineers may not necessarily have when they're coming into the field. Um, it's, it, it kind of reminds me of the idea of like a war of perceptions from the Cold War. Like the US was able to fly reconnaissance planes over the USSR, but the USSR wasn't able to shoot them out of the sky. So they didn't want to admit that the US was 
doing it. Uh, and the US wasn't going to say anything either. And so the actual facts of the matter mattered less as uh, opposed to what the perception of each of the countries are because you know the soviet union didn't want to say like we can see this thing but we can't shoot it out of the sky and the us didn't want to uh say that yeah we're we're spying on uh, a country that we're not actually uh in a formal war with um so i'm curious like for you was this how, how did that sort of uh coming across that that model of thinking about things how did that sort of uh change the way you you look at this this topic from coming from an engineering background yeah there's a common perception which i think is is deeply flawed that the world can or at least the the engineering world the engineering arena can be divided into technical issues and social issues and that these exist separately of one another and i think it's pretty easy to counter that if you're a practicing engineer if you work for a firm I'm sure you've been in a situation where you have some problem that you want to solve with a given technology, and you can come up with some kind of perfect, exquisite machine or device that would solve that problem 100% across the board, but it would cost you know more than the net worth of your, your entire firm, something like this. So the goal of the engineer in essentially any situation is not to come up with the solution that works best for a narrowly defined problem, but to come up with a solution that can be implemented on a reasonable schedule, on a reasonable budget, and that will solve the problem, not in an absolute grand sense, but will solve it in a satisfactory sense, right? That's what engineering is all about, uh, from my view. And so given that that kind of social constraint, these cost issues, these uh, calendar issues are so ingrained in just what an engineer does on their day-to-day -day basis, then looking at that, it maybe becomes a little easier to accept that the social world and the technical world are not separate things, that the social context, the environment in which we as engineers exist and operate in, uh, that is necessarily going to shape the solutions that we come up to the problems uh, that we come up with for, for the problems that we're faced with. And at an even more fundamental level, the kind of scope of the solutions that even appear apparent to us. So I think there's a good illustration here in that um, mining of uh, the burial site for, for this uh, potentially buried weapons plutonium, where to the US, as I mentioned, we don't use plutonium as a fuel at all. Uh, it has been attempted a few times. Industry has uh, essentially shown zero interest in it because it would accomplish the same things as using conventional uranium-based fuel, just it would be more expensive. It would be harder to produce. The supply chain would be less... Uh, predictable and, and reliable. So it's just, you know, looking at all the social aspects involved in here, uh, a bad idea across the board. So then if you're a US scientist or an engineer uh, tasked with dealing with this plutonium issue, and you think about buried plutonium, putting it in some what's called a geologic repository off in the middle of the desert of southeastern New Mexico, Maybe that starts to look like a pretty good idea because you uh, are ingrained in a, a tradition of practice, a culture of engineering practice in which this material is really waste, it's trash. So sequestering it where it's not going to harm people, where you don't have to think about it ever again, you don't have to pay the costs of securing it and maintaining uh, the physical infrastructure around and the guards and so on. That seems great. And it's hard to imagine that you're going to, you know, throw something in a dumpster and then later go on and dig it out. If you're a Russian scientist or engineer, however, you exist in a very different social environment. You uh, operate within a nation that has for, for decades, essentially since the discovery of, of radiation, viewed nuclear energy and the prospects for uh, mass generation of, of energy using nuclear technologies in a very utopian sense. And key to their national energy strategy for many decades has been the use of plutonium as a civilian nuclear fuel. There's this utopian dream amongst much of the Russian uh, scientific and technical community, but also uh, among the public of nuclear arms control being something that can shift in a sort of swords to plowshares manner, shift uh, all of the expense and all of the effort that has gone towards uh, development of these terrible weapons towards more utopian, more civil ends. And so if you think about the plutonium you're taking out of nuclear weapons and then say, hey, this can be burned in nuclear reactors, and not only does it make it less useful for weapons purposes, but it generates energy as well, 
that fits quite well into this distinct framing of the problem or this distinct mental model that is prominent in, in the Russian technical, the Russian scientific, the Russian engineering community. And therefore, again, the problems that immediately come to mind and that seem worthy of pursuit for that technical community are going to be very different than the solutions and the recognition of a problem in the first place that you see in the American technological community. And this does some, some important work when it comes to explaining why, in that case, for instance, two nations could have their quite, uh, quite capable scientists and technologists and engineers look at the same problem of how to permanently or irreversibly get rid of this weapons plutonium and come to vastly different uh, conclusions about what is the best solution, about how hard it would be to mine this material and reuse it. And so those social dynamics and understanding how they color the conclusions that we draw as engineers are uh, just key to the entire process and something that absolutely cannot be ignored when it comes to dealing with these technologies that are fundamentally transnational and uh, across disciplinary. That's really interesting to to hear you say that that's, that's kind of the perspective that Russian scientists and uh, the, yeah, the social context there of it really being like a valuable resource that can be reused and, and sort of turned into civilian, yeah, the civilian resource for, for wealth and, and, and well-being and uh, prosperous life uh, to not understand that would just, yeah, not work um, when you're trying to, yeah, integrate policies between different countries and, and come to these agreements. Uh, what's, how do you, how then do you, do you get around that? I mean, how do you ensure that there is a sharing of the social context amongst countries who are trying to enter into these types of arrangements? One of the most important things there is simple dialogue. Uh, so looking in, in recent decades, this entire plutonium disposition, uh, effort was launched in the early 1990s by meetings between the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, members of that academy, and its counterpart, the Russian Academy of Sciences. So this wasn't something that was uh, spearheaded initially by the U.S. State Department or, or its equivalent in Russia or anything like that. It wasn't a political effort. It started out as scientists and engineers saying, essentially, we played a big part in creating this problem. We're now the best people equipped to manage the, uh, the outcomes that have resulted. And that's a tradition that spans back many decades. So you have uh, something called the Pugwash Conferences, which is a long-standing uh, series of meetings between primarily scientists and engineers from the United States and Russia, started during the Cold War, with, again, the recognition that these are, in many cases, the only communities who can seriously grapple with these problems, because they're the only communities equipped at all to, to really understand on the technical side what's even at stake and what's going on here. Uh, so these kinds of forefront technology issues, when they're particularly security relevant, demand that kind of dialogue, even if it's you know difficult and even if the clashing national frames and technological frames uh, present among these different technical communities make progress there challenging. The only real solution to that is if not to adopt the same kinds of national or technological frames, at least to understand as best you can why other communities are coming to opposite conclusions, right? And then go home and report to your policymakers, hey, this is the uh, technical challenge. This is the space we have for, for advancement here. So scientists and engineers have and will continue to have a, a key role, a role that no one else essentially, no other community could, could replace, could substitute for when it comes to arms control issues. And also, arguably, uh, sort of a duty to engage in these because it was initially, I'm sure, again, everyone saw Oppenheimer. It was scientists and engineers who got us into this place in the first place. Yeah, I'm curious how you, so particularly with this issue, how do you go from seeing the announcement that the PMDA treaty was was being wound down or that, that it wasn't succeeding because of this uh, decision by the U.S. to instead of uh, irreparably destroying the plutonium to bury it instead. How do you sort of see that happening and decide to pursue the research direction of, yeah, trying to understand what the actual facts of the matter are? Like from, I guess, from more of like a meta level, how do you select the uh, 
the direction that you want to take your research? On the one hand, I mean, this is just one of many reasons, but I think it's just fundamentally interesting, right? Like so often, you know, doing all of the, the physics and the engineering work I've done, so often I, like I think most people, uh, tend to fall into this trap of thinking that the work I'm doing is just technical. And once we have a technical fix to this issue, the issue will disappear or it will be addressed. And I think the PMDA, this whole plutonium management thing, is a good example of a case where we arguably have technical fixes. You know, we, we could bury these things. We could convert them to nuclear fuel and irradiate them. But that's not enough. And so if you're an engineer and you have this uh, solution-focused mindset, this solution-oriented practice, then that should be deeply disappointing in one sense. But it should also be a pretty strong call to action, or at least a call to look further into the issue, right? Uh, people will often say, oh, you know, especially in the nuclear space, we've solved all these problems. They're just political issues now. Well, I mean, like, that's the biggest issue I could imagine, right? Like that means that the engineers need to do more work to find a solution that can uh, surmount those political challenge, challenges the same way. If you're designing a phone or a software or something like that, you need to design one that can cost effectively be produced or that can be distributed or what have you. I mean, that is part of the engineering agenda, the obligation of the engineer to design a product that works in more sense than just one, works in the sense of being feasible to produce or to deploy or what have you. And when it comes to arms control efforts, you know, they also have to be politically feasible. And so I do, again, think that that kind of work on the social issues is still engineering, right? Is still core to the engineering practice in this arena. And so, as you mentioned, in a way, it, it can be disappointing. It can be uh, not, not particularly motivating to see these things fall apart. But in a way, that's also a call to, to keep working hard on it. And as I was alluding to earlier, there is the fact that Politics is transitory and, and scientific knowledge, uh, of course, can be lost, um, isn't, isn't necessarily permanent, but probably lasts a lot longer, right? And probably contributes to something that in many ways is, is larger than any state, you know, which is going to exist for a set amount of time, but often not more than, than a few thousand years if you're lucky. So scientific knowledge is something that can have uh, knock-on effects far further down the line. And so pursuit of that, I think, is intrinsically a, a noble endeavor or, and worthy of our time, even if in the short term, it can be quite disappointing. Yeah, I think the ability to sort of step back and look at it on like a thousand year time scale uh, seems really valuable here for, yeah, particularly for, for this topic of research, because as you say, yeah, once that, that understanding is developed, it's it's there and it can be used when the time comes and then when the, the, the political Overton window shifts or widens to be able to accept those uh, technically feasible interventions that actually shift the needle uh, to, to a safer world. Um, I guess I want to move on to the uh, discussion on hypersonic missiles. So yeah, it's an interesting uh there's some interesting similarities with the, the plutonium um, disposal uh, research that you've been doing and also some uh, differences in that instead of it being sort of externally facing from the US uh, and sort of the uh, international relations sort of domain, it's more looking at uh, internal national, um, I guess, policy and, and defense posture. Um, so you're able to give me a bit of an overview of um, what the the modeling, the performance of hypersonic boost glide missiles paper was about and, and what you were hoping to uh, achieve with that? Yeah, so hypersonic missiles, uh, this is a, a class of missile technologies that is often billed within the last 10 or 20 years as sort of the next step in missile warfare, as this revolution or this game changer when it comes to missile technologies. So this is work that I did with a, a colleague, David Wright, currently at, at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, to try and initially just quantify some of these claims, say, well, how revolutionary are these things? Just how much are they going to change the game? You know, uh, 
you often see claims that these things will so substantially reduce the time it, get, it takes for a missile to get from point A to point B that it's going to change how global security and warfare work across the board. So first, some basics. Uh, a missile, of course, is a, a device often in many ways analogous to an uncrewed airplane that instead of getting passengers from point A to point B, gets usually an explosive warhead from point A to point B. So the idea is that it allows you as the possessor of your missiles to impose kinetic military strategic effects on an adversary that can be hundreds or even thousands or tens of thousands of kilometers away. So if you'd like for intercontinental ballistic missiles, uh, you can impose that kind of kinetic effect on an adversary on the opposite side of the globe. So the kind of traditional existing widely used technology for doing that for the long range delivery of explosive warheads is the ballistic missile. A ballistic missile is in many ways uh, analogous to, to a baseball. So when you throw a baseball, of course, or and sorry for, for international audiences, you can replace this with any other kind of ball you're throwing. Uh, just as an, I'm a big baseball fan, so that's what my, my, my mind immediately goes to. But if you think about throwing a ball, then you really just propel it. That is your, your hand and your arm and your body uh, um, lend kinetic energy to it over a brief period of time when you're first doing that throwing motion, and then you release it. And for the rest of its trajectory towards wherever you're throwing it at, it's essentially in free fall. It's just gravity, and of course, it's in the, the atmosphere, so air resistance acting on that thing. A ballistic missile works more or less the same way. You have a large rocket booster, so a rocket engine that burns fuel to accelerate that missile as quickly as possible for tens of seconds or a few minutes, depending on the range you're trying to get that thing to. And then once it runs out of fuel, that will detach from the rest of the missile, fall back to Earth, and then just a small part at the front of your missile, analogous to the baseball, now is traveling at a very high speed, so it will continue on in a long arcing path towards its target. Now, if you're targeting something, say, thousands of kilometers away, if you're the United States or Russia targeting the other nation with one of your intercontinental ballistic missiles, then the arcing flight path that that follows is going to take it high up into outer space, out of the atmosphere. And this, in the initial development of the ballistic missile, was seen as a huge advantage because up there, of course, you don't have air resistance. So you essentially maintain that high speed that you achieved in the first few minutes of flight for more or less the rest of your flight until you very quickly re-enter the atmosphere and then hit your target. So that's the ballistic missile. Hypersonic missiles are different. Now, the term hypersonic is a little bit confusing or a bit of a misnomer because it refers to a speed. It refers to something that's traveling more than about five times the speed of sound, or Mach 5. That means hypersonic. More than Mach 1 is supersonic, and then you say, well, at Mach 5, it's a little different. You start having chemistry with the air that is uh, fundamentally distinct. And so we need a new word for that, and we'll call that hypersonic. Hyper, you know, more than super, right? A better marketing term, at least. So... Hypersonic missiles, though, are not actually defined uh, or distinguished from other missile technologies like ballistic missiles by their speed. So the most common, the uh, currently deployed kind of hypersonic weapon, which I'll be focusing on, is the hypersonic boost glide vehicle. Called that because initially it operates exactly the same as a ballistic missile does with a large rocket booster that accelerates that uh, to very high speed. But instead of then flying on this high arcing path like a baseball would, uh, it's maybe more akin to a paper airplane, where once your arm accelerates it and then lets go, a hypersonic missile will dive back down into the atmosphere and then take advantage of lift. It'll have small wings or winglets on it, fins, this sort of thing, that allows it to glide through the atmosphere until it gets to its target and then it dives back down to the ground. So that's the basic fundamental difference. Now, again, this is commonly billed as this revolutionary technology, one common claim being that they're just so much faster than ballistic missiles, that a ballistic missile between, say, uh, Washington, D.C. and Moscow might take about half an hour. You'll often hear people saying that a, uh, a hypersonic missile could do that in half the time. So initially, my colleague and I were, were looking at some of these arguments and saying, oh, that's interesting. You know, let's do some modeling to figure out just how much faster a hypersonic weapon is. And it's complicated because 
uh, you do have a shorter path length if you're not going high into outer space and then back down, right? So if you're going a, a shorter path distance, ultimately, that's an argument for why you would get there faster. But there's a pretty obvious counter argument to that, which is that when you're flying through the atmosphere, of course, you have drag as well, right? Like this was why ballistic missiles were seen as such as an, uh, an amazing technology when they were first developed in, uh, in the 1940s, 1950s, and so on, because they go through outer space. And outer space, if you want to fly fast, is a pretty good place to be. So we started quantifying these things, and, and really quickly, we, we were surprised because we were seeing, hey, like no matter how we're setting up our model, we can't find a situation where a hypersonic missile gets to its target faster than a ballistic missile if you're optimizing both of your trajectories for minimizing that delivery time. And so we started modeling some other things, looking at other common claims of hypersonic weapon superiority, uh, claims that they are more or less invisible, that existing detection systems can't see them. So, hey, maybe if they don't get there faster, if the adversary doesn't even know they're coming, maybe that's an advantage for you. And we started seeing the same sort of thing where we noticed, well, hypersonic weapon, when it's flying through the atmosphere at more than five times the speed of sound, of course, it gets really hot, the same way a space shuttle does when it's re-entering the atmosphere. And that heat is quite visible to the existing satellite sensors that exist across the globe. The US has a constellation for this. Russia has a constellation as well, watching for missile launches. Because when that rocket booster is burning in the initial few minutes of flight, of course, that's that rocket plume is really bright, so you can see it from outer space. But if your hypersonic glider, which is gliding through the atmosphere, is really hot as well, what we found is that it would be quite visible to these sorts of sensors. So that's another case where a ballistic missile flying through outer space, where it's not subjected to this aerothermodynamic heating, actually has its own advantage here. Also, when it comes to defending against missiles, there's a common claim you'll see that there's no way to intercept a hypersonic weapon. And that's something we've been modeling as well. And what we found is that actually because of the drag that slows your hypersonic glider down by the time it gets to its target, often it will be traveling slowly enough that it's more interceptable, more easy to intercept than a ballistic missile because that ballistic missile has not been slowed to the same extent because it was flying through outer space. And so all of this analysis we've done kind of points to this, this conclusion that Okay, hypersonic weapons might have some advantages in fairly niche, very specific missions, but across the board, actually, this, this narrative of them being you know, the next step, the evolution, the game changer in missile technology is, is vastly overblown. And so then if you look at the history of the hypersonic glide vehicle, you find something really interesting. So today it's commonly billed uh, by the term emerging technology. So people like to position it alongside AI and quantum computing and things like this. The hypersonic glide vehicle, the first complete design for one came in the 1930s. So the Nazi government had this project called the, the America Bomber Project. From the name, you can probably guess it was meant to develop a, a delivery system, a warhead delivery system that would allow attacks on America from the German homeland. And essentially, it's a complicated story, but the German military was presented with a number of potential designs. One of those was the hypersonic glide vehicle as we know it today, and the other was the ballistic missile. And so the German military, they looked at all of these designs and essentially said, hey, this hypersonic glide thing is interesting. It's, it's like an airplane, but it can go longer distances, higher speeds. But we really like this ballistic missile thing because this goes through outer space. So this is, is much more technologically advanced and this is the one we're gonna go with. And so it was Germany that actually built the first ballistic missile, the German V2. And it was German scientists that afterwards went to the Soviet Union, went to the US and then brought that kind of technology with them and, and spurred this entire uh, missile development that happened subsequently and got us to where we are today with intercontinental ballistic missiles being fielded by a number of nations. So you have this kind of inversion where the thing that was seen as inferior before has essentially been forgotten for a long period of time and then rediscovered and built as this new emerging technology that's so far superior to the thing that ultimately it was, or that, that initially it was seen as inferior to. And I think this is another illustration of how these social dynamics are so critical to what happens technologically because the thing that you see as better or worse will often be colored by, you know, how recently you heard of it 
rather than what its actual capabilities are, which is why we're working so hard and, and a number of other scientists and engineers are working hard to actually quantify these things, put down clear technical information that isn't just something somebody is saying at congressional testimony to try and get more money for weapons development, but saying, no, the physics of, of, of atmospheric flight tells us that this thing would take this long to get from point A to point B. I think that's a much more useful kind of data than uh, just a claim or a marketing opinion. Right. Yeah, because how do policymakers typically be seeking information on the capabilities of weapon systems when they're making decisions around acquisition? I'll, I'll speak on this from the U.S. perspective, because this is one of the three nations most uh, um, most ardently pursuing hypersonic weapons technologies alongside Russia and China. So in the U.S., we don't have a very uniform, codified system for getting this kind of technical information to policymakers. Uh, we had something called the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment, but this was, uh, was, was essentially dismantled in the, the late 90s, early 2000s. And so now we have other services like the Congressional Research Service, which is just supposed to provide research uh, capabilities to, to legislators in Congress, but in a general sense, not with a, a technology focus. So this thing that is so key to ensuring that the representatives that uh, American citizens trust to represent their interests when it comes to things like emerging technologies and military technologies, uh, they don't have a very good way to get this information. That's not necessarily the worst thing in the world, because even without, uh, you know, an institution uh, ex with the express purpose of, of conveying this sort of, sort of information to policymakers, they can sometimes rely on, say, universities, on scholars to look into these sorts of things and provide this dispassionate, unbiased information that they need to make good decisions. But when you get to these sort of frontier technologies, you often run into situations where most of the funding for work in these areas comes from the proponents of these technologies, right? So if the United States Department of Defense is really interested in hypersonic weapons, they might, and they have, start funding a lot of university work in that area. And so if you're a researcher in an aeronautical engineering department and you're funded to do work on hypersonic weapons development, then you probably have a pretty strong motivation to sell that technology, to sell it as the next big thing, as the solution to a, a large problem set to ensure that the technology that you are dedicating a, a large part of your life to developing is going to be successful. And this is not, not, uh, not a bad thing necessarily. You know, This is something that happens with essentially any engineering endeavor. Uh, key to engineering is making a product that people want to purchase. And that's just as true for weapons development as it is for, for making a new iPhone. But what that means is that if you don't have uh, people who aren't proponents, you know, people with a little less skin in the game, so to say, advising the regulators, then you maybe run into some problems where you can develop uh, situations, you can end up in situations where there's a monopoly on technical knowledge and technical advising possessed by people who are just big fans of a certain technology and therefore understandably are going to promote it. And so I think that's something that's definitely happening right now in the hypersonic weapons space and uh, a reason that we need, again, more scientists and engineers who aren't necessarily building their whole careers around hypersonic weapons, for instance, but are just interested in providing that kind of technical analysis on this issue and saying, hey, you know, you're policymakers, it's your job to decide what to do here. But this is what you need to understand if you actually want to know what this new weapon that you're considering funding is going to do. Mm. Because what in, in an ideal world, how would you see the, like an institution participate in those sorts of discussions? Would it be something like people working in roles similar to you who when governments are facing these decisions and, and creating policies around these topics are able to step in and provide some independent and uh, yeah, objective research and information around capabilities? Or yeah, is, is there some sort of institutional sort of design here that would, would improve the situation? Absolutely. And of course, I'm pretty biased here, right? I'm a, a physical scientist or an engineer working at a university trying to provide uh, unbiased technical information to policymakers. Uh, 
So of course, I'm going to think that scientists or engineers working at universities trying to provide unbiased technical information to policymakers is exactly what we need more of. Uh, but but I really do believe that's true. Um, when we come to new and complex technologies uh, that will have or could have pretty dramatic repercussions for things like global security, which of course impacts every living human being and those that will live in the future, then there's really an obligation, I believe, uh, for technical communities to look into this, to say, you know, we as a community have developed tools for understanding this issue. Here is that information provided to you, the policymaker, in an intelligible, digestible way so that you can make the best decision possible. Uh, I can't imagine a mission that could be more important for a scientist or engineer than that, especially for engineers, because, you know, you're the one interfacing with society when it comes to these technical topics. Universities historically have been a place for doing just that. Of course, the education mission is is forefront uh, for the, the role of the university, but that's really educating scientists and engineers, amongst others, to be able to do this, to go on and become an integrated part of whatever society they're in and essentially do good work in that society. And universities, in addition to that immediate teaching role, can fulfill a teaching role more broadly when it comes to a policymaker that needs advice about a certain issue. A university, ideally, would be a place they could go and say, hey, you know, you're not reliant on, on my decision to, to ensure that you get paid your salary, right, or anything like that. You're a separate institution. You work at a university. You can just, to the extent possible, separate yourself from all of that social stuff that, as we know, dramatically influences the way that even scientists and engineers uh, observe the world around them and come to conclusions regarding it. So if you're like the most in, uh, insulated person I could imagine from some of these social issues, maybe you're a good person to go to for advice and get just you know the dispassionate facts on the ground about this stuff. Universities are sometimes, and scholars are sometimes having a lot of trouble there because the funding situation uh, can often implicate uh, scientists and engineers in, at universities in some of these social considerations uh, that color their views. But that's why places uh, like CSAC, the Center for International Security and Cooperation here at Stanford, that really strive for, for dispassionate, for unbiased policy assessment can be so important. Mm. So in that case, how do you, so how does CSEC and how do similar institutions ensure that they are able to get funding to be able to do this dispassionate and objective level research, uh, while still basically yet being, uh, or being able to be financially viable in, in an ongoing sense? That's always a challenge. Uh, we've been fortunate that there are a number of, of foundations, uh, for example, philanthropic organizations that have an interest in these kinds of issues and recognize that, hey, you know, nuclear security might not necessarily be the most lucrative thing in the world. Nuclear arms control, for example, might not be the most lucrative thing in the world, but is pretty important, especially if you're interested in, in long term thinking about these issues. And so fortunately, universities are, are kind of set up for doing things that aren't necessarily immediately uh, uh, profitable, but are quite important for the society in which they exist. And so that's why parts of this mission fit so well into the university context. And fortunately, there are foundations uh, that have been interested in similar issues. So until quite recently, the MacArthur Foundation, for example, was a major donor to uh, academic programs focusing on nuclear security issues. And here at CSAC, uh, a lot of the programs that, that we operate uh, has been funded by that. Uh, the Stanton Foundation is another one that has taken a key interest in these issues and provided ongoing funding for CSAC work and for CSAC's training of the next generation of uh, practitioners, including uh, physical scientists and engineers who are interested in these issues. But that that pool of funding is is always uh, always threatened, so to say. Uh, it's, it's not nearly as reliable as uh, funding for research in a number of other fields, especially in the sciences and, and in engineering, where there are quite lucrative things you could be pursuing. Uh, 
So that always makes it a, a challenge to, to maintain and continue the kind of work that we do at CSEC. Uh, but we've been quite fortunate that CSEC was founded in uh, 1983, I believe, and exists to this day in, in quite a, a similar form and is, has continued to carry out that mission of training the next generation of experts on these issues and pursuing policy impact to make sure that policymakers across the globe have the best information, including technical information available to them. Yeah, it's great that it exists and that was started in the first place because it definitely seems like the type of organization whose founding isn't in any way guaranteed and whose continued or ability to continue operating uh, is, is, isn't guaranteed either. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it was initially founded by um, a social scientist, uh, John Lewis, a, a China expert, and a physicist, Sidney Drell. And to this day, we've maintained this co-leadership uh, situation where there's always one social scientist, always one physical scientist uh, directing, co-directing the program. And the fact that we've been able to maintain that kind of cross-disciplinary work as well, uh, which, as I've mentioned, is, I really think, key to the whole thing. Uh, has been quite fortunate because that's what got me into the field as I was talking about earlier was just doing a fellowship at CSEC. So I absolutely would not be working in this space did the the institution not exist. And for for future generations, you know, anyone who agrees with me, and of course you don't have to, but if you agree with me that this kind of work is important, then we should all hope that places like this continue to exist to ensure that people who can do that work know about it and get the opportunity to do so. Yeah, definitely. I think it'd be interesting to to discuss a little bit around the the ethics of being an engineer because it strikes me that a lot of the work and then sort of the way you discuss your work, it's ethical considerations are very uh, front of mind in the types of topics you're interested in investigating in your research uh, and the sort of the communications that you do around that, um, uh, especially with it being very policy centric um, and looking at some of the sort of greater harms that could come from the technologies that you're researching in the nuclear space. We were discussing before we jumped on the call um, around the, the IEEE's uh, code of ethics. So the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers in the US released or updated their code of ethics to basically have line items in there that talked about you know, ethical design and sustainable development practices to protect the privacy of others and to disclose promptly factors that may endanger the public or the environment. Um, another line is you know, to improve understanding by individuals and society of the capabilities and societal implications of conventional and emerging technologies, including intelligent systems. For me, like personally, I always, always uh, strive to act in an ethical manner, but have never really thought too hard about the ethical sort of um, consequences of, of the engineering. I think part of that is because I've really gone from undergrad straight into a PhD that was, um, yeah, somewhat more abstracted or uh, from from reality um, or from you know actual application. But it strikes me that for many engineers, there's probably uh, in their day to day practice, they're probably not really bumping up against these ethical concerns. Um, but in the context of nuclear security and the defense industry, it seems like that would be much, uh, much more the case. And I'm curious sort of how you think about the, the boundaries of this code of ethics when it comes to engineering, both in the research that you're doing, and I guess looking, uh, across the fence, so to speak at people who are in the defense industry and, uh, proponents for, uh, kind of playing this this marketing game for, in the case of hypersonic missiles, um, you know, weapons technologies and, and things of that nature. Yeah, there are a lot of challenges when it comes to being an ethical engineer if you're doing weapons development. Not to say that you can't do so, but it, you know, if you're, if you're building a bridge, it's a little more straightforward. Build one that's not going to collapse, or if it is going to collapse, at least not when people are on it, hopefully. Uh, so the, the first listed... Uh, obligation of the ethical engineer, to use an example uh, in the IEEE Code of Ethics, is to hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. And you'll find similar uh, uh, obligations in essentially any engineering code of ethics. That, of course, for most technologies is, is pretty obvious, you know, build cars with airbags, build bridges that aren't going to collapse, and so on. 
for weapons development, it's a little more tricky, right? Because the safety and health of the public is something that is directly threatened by the technologies that you're developing to a certain extent. Uh, obviously, not typically the public of your nation, but the public of a, another nation for, for military technologies that might be used in war. So a lot of engineering ethicists have thought quite hard about this issue. And generally, the conclusion that they draw is that what this uh, obligates the engineer to do, what this obliges the engineer to do, is essentially to think hard and to ensure that at least to the best of their belief and knowledge, the weapons technologies they're developing will be used for just war, essentially, to engage in military action that will ultimately net increase the safety, health, and welfare of the public. So a common argument for this is, you know, look at the Second World War. Uh, I think most would agree that the um, downfall of the Nazi regime was a good thing for the net safety, health, and welfare of the public, even though it involved the use of weapons against humans who were killed by those weapons technologies. So this is an argument for uh, engineers to ensure that, or to at least strongly believe that what they're doing is going to contribute to just causes. Where it becomes even more complicated, though, is when it comes to that recently added uh, section that you were speaking about earlier. So this is uh, the second listed obligation in the IEEE Code of Ethics, quote, to improve the understanding by individuals and society of the capabilities and societal implications of conventional and emerging technologies. And so this was recently added to the IEEE Code of Ethics because as, as electrical engineers, especially those involved on the computer side of things, uh, the AI question is at the, the forefront of their minds, the need to ensure that these technologies are developed in a way that benefits humanity. When it comes to weapons technologies, though, that raises slightly different issues because as I was just talking about in the hypersonic weapons case, it's, it's very typical for these kinds of technical development programs to need to do things like convince skeptical uh, legislative appropriators that your technology should be funded rather than anything else that could be funded with the limited money that any state government, any national government has. And so this might be, you know, the decision to, to fund and, and develop and acquire a missile versus funding and uh, developing systems for the provision of healthcare. But it, it also could just as easily be developing one missile versus developing another, you know, investing in hypersonic missile technologies or investing in ballistic missile technologies. And if you truly believe that both of these will be put to just ends, there's still an ethical question here about whether what you're... Uh, advising essentially the policymaker to do, whether the technology that you're sort of uh, speaking up, that you're marketing to them, is the one that best accomplishes that goal of uh, ensuring victory in a just war. So this is challenging, though, because essentially as an engineer, especially if you're the one speaking to the congressional appropriators, you're tasked with ensuring that they're going to fund your system. And from a, a personal perspective, you don't often get promoted if you're hired to develop a hypersonic missile by going and saying, well, hypersonic missiles don't really do anything that uh, the people in this other division over there can't do with their ballistic missile technologies. So there is a, a sort of tension here between something that is core to your, your job, which is successfully developing a technology, and the ethical uh, aspect of things, which is always speaking uh, in a, an unbiased and a dispassionate way to inform people about what your technology actually does. And we pretty clearly in the hypersonic weapons case see some failures there because there are key instances where people uh, working in the Department of Defense, for example, in the US who oftentimes are engineers will go and say things like, well, a hypersonic weapon is so much faster than a ballistic missile. And they'll often uh, couch that statement uh, saying something like, well, a hypersonic weapon uh, can get from Russia to the United States in half the time a ballistic missile could, depending on where it's launched from. And the depending on where it's launched from case is, uh, clause is key there because, you know, of course, something launched closer to its target gets to its target faster if it's close enough, even compared to a, a much faster ballistic missile. But of course, if you're a legislator who's sitting there deciding what to fund, you're probably not thinking so much about, oh, the trade-offs between uh, forward basing of your missiles, putting them closer to their targets, and delivery time and the speed at which it flies. You know, that's some, some pretty technical stuff. 
So you're just hearing, oh, this person says hypersonic missiles are faster. We should fund them so that we can get our own before Russia does. We should fund defenses targeting them because there are some kind of super weapon that the Russians are developing. So if you don't have good, dispassionate, unbiased technical advice provided to policymakers, you create a lot of opportunity for engineers who aren't necessarily upholding that ethical obligation to uh, improve the understanding by individuals and societies of these technologies to promote the technologies that they're developing, regardless of whether they're actually the best tool for the job. So when we think about solutions to this, uh, engineering and particularly engineering societies, I think have uh, some great opportunities here because the physical sciences and the natural sciences have done a pretty good job in many cases of creating institutions for advising policymakers in the absence of things like a congressional office specifically set up to do those sorts of things. Uh, APS, the American Physical Society, for example, one of the largest uh, professional associations of physicists, has a uh, panel on public affairs, uh, a piece of that organization set up specifically to look at pressing technological issues that overlap with, of course, public and social concerns. And so they regularly issue reports uh, on a variety of issues, often including things like missile defense or new missile technologies to say, well, this is what the physics tells us. This is what you as a policymaker need to know the basics if you want to make good decisions on this issue. It would be a great idea, I think, for engineering societies to start to do some of the same types of things because engineers in many cases, as I've mentioned a few times, are much better equipped often to engage on those social issues because the work they do is often closer to the public and to the society in which they act than the typical physicist who is, is a little bit more removed in many cases. Yeah, I think it, there's a lot there to sort of reflect upon as an engineer and how you interface with the world and kind of what your obligations are in, in doing that. For people in the audience who might be interested in uh, entering that sort of space and uh, doing some of this more policy related engineering research and work, like, do you have suggestions for how they are best to enter the field and sort of what pathways they should be pursuing or what skills they should be looking to build to uh, work in, I guess, in particular, the nuclear and international security fields? Yeah. So if you're a grad student or you're, uh, you've graduated with a PhD, which is, of course, the professional path I'm most familiar with, then fellowship programs, I think, are by far the most useful thing you could look into. This is, as I mentioned earlier, how I got into the field. Uh, places like CSAC here at Stanford, the Belfer Center at Harvard University uh, offer one or two year fellowships for people, including scientists and engineers, often with no background in this particular subfield to come and work on it. And that's, again, because it's it's just not on many people's radar, but there's so much that the typical scientist or engineer can do here that just getting them in the room is so valuable. Uh, so in, on the CSAC side, uh, that application is open right now. I encourage everyone to just Google CSAC, uh, C-I-S-A-C fellowships, and you'll find it. Uh, we have fellowships specifically for physical scientists, natural scientists, and engineers to come and work on these kinds of issues. So if it's something you're at all interested in, uh, as I was, and you even have little to no background in it, as I did, then that's a great opportunity to come and spend even just a year thinking and working on these issues to see where you can contribute. Uh, if you're not in that um, PhD kind of space, there are still a lot of opportunities at think tanks or at um, activist organizations that work on some of these issues. So the uh, Plowshares Foundation is one of these that has a, a key interest in nuclear security. Uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists is another one. So they both hire people to work on these exact issues, uh, also are, are um, funded uh, by the public uh, to a large extent. So if you don't want to directly work on these issues, um, they are always seeking out donations to, to fund this kind of uh, research and, and policy advising effort. Yeah, that's really valuable uh, information for people to have. I guess for those who are maybe not quite at the stage of completing a PhD or, or looking to pursue one, are there particular 
engineering disciplines that you think are uh, well suited to to work in this field? That's an interesting question. Uh, so, for nuclear security, of course, nuclear engineering is going to be a, a very important one. But nuclear technologies are are so complicated and and such large constellations of of different practices that they really bring in people from across the the engineering landscape. Uh, and of course, if you're interested in in weapons technologies uh, or arms control or something like this, it's not really just limited to nuclear. Uh, chemical engineers, of course, have played a, a major role in chemical weapons development and most recently in the destruction of stockpiles of chemical weapons across the globe since the uh, Chemical Weapons Convention now makes them illegal under international law. Uh, mechanical engineers, of course, have a, a key role to play in a lot of these issues. Uh, Civil engineers have played a major role in, for example, understanding the effects of nuclear weapons on cities, the effects that they would have if detonated, uh, the fire damage that would occur to buildings, the blast damage that would occur to buildings, and often in developing um, mechanisms for protecting the populace from these sorts of things, for uh, designing structures better able to withstand nuclear blasts, uh, and so on. So really, any any discipline can find somewhere to contribute here. If you're in computer engineering as well, uh, the the overlap between artificial intelligence and nuclear security is, is quite key because a lot of people are thinking about how to integrate AI technologies into nuclear command control communications and the decision making chain uh, writ large. So. It's really hard to think of a discipline that couldn't contribute something important here. And I don't want to leave out the biological space, uh, the biological sciences, bioengineering, and so on. Of course, biosecurity is a key part here. Biological weapons are perhaps the thing that that most uh, closely rivals nuclear weapons in terms of the scale of the destruction that might occur. And places like CSAC uh, are keenly interested in, in those other weapons issues as well as other security issues, chemical weapons, bioweapons. Uh, just security for from any weapon that threatens uh, large scale destruction. Yeah, terrific. It definitely seems like there's a little bit of a uh, little bit of something for everybody coming from an engineering background. If if they are particularly interested in, and passionate about contributing to nuclear and international security. And one I forgot to mention, I know you have a, an aeronautical engineering background or aerospace engineering. Uh, of course, with the hypersonic weapons work, right? That's pretty obvious the kind of uh, uh, um, the kind of stuff you could contribute to that field. And I just feel bad. I'm just a, a lowly materials engineer trying to do, you know, all of this computational modeling, computational fluid dynamic stuff, which I'm, I'm learning as the fly on the fly as I work on these. So we definitely need people from from your field as well, uh, to help the rest of us figure out what we're doing in the first place. Certainly. Do you have like a top resource for engineers and people who are just interested in learning more about nuclear security and the ways you can contribute to that field? I'd say one of the best places uh, to pursue any interest you might have in this uh, to, to figure out what people are thinking about, uh, there's a journal, an academic peer-reviewed journal called Science and Global Security. It's published by uh, Princeton's program on, on global security that involves a, a large number of scientists. And so it's one of the main publication venues for technical folks, STEM folks working on these issues. So that's where you'll see a lot of the uh, timely forefront work when it comes to nuclear security and global security writ large coming from the technical community, from the scientific community, from the engineering community. That's like the main publication venue. And there you can get really detailed analysis that's meant for technical listeners of this podcast. It's really on a level where you're speaking with another PhD scientist in many cases. So that's where you can see what's what's really going on in this arena. Awesome. Uh, what do you wish you had invented and why? I, in elementary school, uh, had to do one day a, a biography of a, a famous individual that we would read on the morning announcements. And mine was, I forget how I, I picked this person, but it was George Washington Carver, uh, an agricultural scientist famous for essentially the development of a massive number of uses for the peanut and uh, different ways of growing peanuts effectively. It's often claimed that he invented peanut butter. Uh, if I understand correctly, that's not technically true. It was all this other stuff he invented. 
uh, related to peanuts, but I'm sure he had a, a key role in the adoption of peanut butter amongst many cultures as a, a common kind of staple food item. And when it comes to engineering type work that can just benefit humanity, it's hard to think of something more important than the uh, provision of uh, cost-effective, calorie-dense food that's shelf-stable for long periods of time. So I've always just really admired that kind of work that seems thankless and something that very few are going to remember you for, but has such a huge impact on the people who most need engineering solutions to their problems. You know, people facing food insecurity, uh, people without access to caloric dense foodstuffs. Um, so I, I've always aspired to hopefully do something that is so basic, no one will notice but will have a lasting positive impact for, you know, it's hard for me to imagine a time when peanut butter doesn't exist. So who knows how, how long lasting that impact that uh, George Washington Carver had will be. Yeah, that's a, that's an awesome answer. I, I really like that. Uh, especially as a proponent of a big proponent of peanut butter as well. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone should be. Uh, terrific. Well, if people want to learn more about your research and the work that you're doing, what's the best place for them to go to to learn? I think actually Google Scholar, if you just search my name on there, scholar.google.com is the best place because you can find everything I've published on this, although it's going to be mixed in with a bunch of stuff about uh, ion accelerators and radiation effects and, and uh, oxides because that's kind of a physics work I've done. But um, if you search through, like search hypersonic or plutonium or something like that, you can find what I've published. And it's also nice because it shows people who have cited that work. So that will be a way of finding uh, work that's going on in the broader technical community interested in these issues. Terrific. Yeah, we'll also include links to uh, the public access papers that, that you've published as well in the show notes and that we've discussed um, in this episode. Um, yeah, Cameron, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been an awesome conversation. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to talk with me. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Cameron. For resources related to this episode, please head to engineeredforimpact.show forward slash Cameron. That's C-A-M-E-R-O-N. The best way you can support this podcast is by leaving us feedback on our website or sharing this episode with a friend or colleague. Thanks for listening and happy problem solving. Thank you.